Hello and welcome to the Transportation of Oil Lecture. So we're going to go through how oil is transported around the world, starting with the shipping flows of transporting cargoes, the key choke points in the world that are very important to analyse and know what's going on in. Then we're going to do oil ports and which are the key ones, the cargoes themselves and the ship and ship names that can accommodate different cargo and parcel sizes, barges which are used on rivers, rail, pipelines and finally storage. So to begin with we have the shipping flows and choke points. So if you take a look at the arrows in the picture in the bottom right, these are the key most used routes. The US used the transatlantic voyage to secure oil or deliver oil from the Mediterranean, Europe and Northwest Europe. South America do the same thing but also US oil can travel from the Gulf Coast all the way through to the Asian market. Then you have the linking between Europe, the Asian market and the Middle Eastern market. This is where the majority of the choke points come in because you're getting through a lot of land here. Probably the most talked about routes or areas is the Suez Canal. So if you go from Europe and want to send your oil to the Middle East or vice versa, you need to get through Africa and through the Suez Canal. And then once you're through here, you have access to the Mediterranean. And in the Mediterranean, you can either go to a port in the Mediterranean or Spain. And then that gives you access to the US and the Americas or Northwest Europe. So it's very important. As the name suggests, the Suez Canal, that is the area. So Suez Maxes are the maximum size that can go through. So Suez Max is a type of cargo ship, which we'll talk about in more detail a bit later. But the bigger oil ships, if they want to transport oil from the Middle East to Europe or the other way around, they're going to need to go all the way around Africa and the Cape of Good Hope. So this route is very common for the bigger ships. In Asia, where you can see the 15.2 circle in this picture, this is Singapore. Singapore is the biggest bunkering hub in the world. For countries such as China, they'll get a lot of oil through their pipelines from Russia, but also will charter ships to deliver oil from Singapore, who will get their oil from everywhere around the world. So that's why so much activity is concentrated around Singapore. China, which is a huge consumer of oil from the open market, as well as the Southeast Asian market, all source their oil using these routes. Other significant choke points include the Straits of Malacca, which are the straits that lead to Singapore. It's a very narrow patch of water, so narrow in fact that it's actually quite susceptible to pirating, of which they corner the ships or board the ships to take over their cargo to then sell on or take hostages. That happens a lot there, but also as you can imagine, if that was to be blocked off, the access to Singapore becomes very difficult, and therefore the largest bunkering hub is ultimately blocked and that would cause shockwaves throughout the whole physical oil market. Similarly, with the Suez Canal, given so much goes through to get to Europe or from Europe to the Middle East, if that was to be closed off, which there has been talk of in the past, that would be a considerably tense situation both politically and economically. But I think the most serious choke point given the conflicts in the area is the Straits of Hummuz, which we've zoomed in on on the top right picture. So Saudi Arabia are the third biggest producers of oil after the US and Russia, and they can only send their oil in the waterborne market through the Straits of Hummuz. But well, remember that Iran is directly above that and the actual strait itself is right on Iran's doorstep. So as there have been, and there continues to exist, conflicts between Saudi Arabia and Iran owing to sectarian issues and continual sectarian violence in the area. That friction means that this area is critical because if Iran do shut this off, you are cutting off export production from Saudi Arabia, the third biggest producer in the world, but also Qatar, the UAE and Kuwait. These countries combined would be close to a fifth of the world's oil market production taken off immediately. So given this closure, and if Iran also don't export themselves, there'd be a third of the world's production that is exported that would just be immediately shut off by closing this strait. So this would be absolutely enormous for the oil market. You would see price spikes of 20 to 30 dollars easily. As I said briefly, Singapore is the world's largest bunkering hub. We've got some pictures here. This is actually what it looks like. So if you go to Singapore, you'll see a lot of ships anchored. Singapore provides the key route through to China and Southeast Asia, but also given it's also the largest bunkering hub, it makes sense that it's the key pricing hub for oil products in Asia, and a lot of benchmarks are centered around the price of oil in Singapore, because so much oil is exchanged there on a physical basis. It also acts as a storage terminal on land or floating storage with the ships, and this is an example of what a storage terminal can look like. Uh, and again, it's a pricing hub and benchmark so a critical area for Asia and Middle East pricing of crude and oil products. So next we've got ARA. So the ARA is the combination of the ports of Amsterdam, Rotterdam and Antwerp. Generally speaking, we call this Northwest Europe. So when we talk about the Mediterranean, that will be the Baltic Mediterranean areas. 
and that will give access to more of the Eastern European markets. But the Northwest Europe market, that it will typically refer to this area. So you've got cargoes that can dock and unload their supply in Amsterdam, Rotterdam and Antwerp. But the key thing is that the refineries are located very near here, so they can get immediate access from around the world for crude oil, and they can also send their products immediately from their refineries to the rest of the global market. But the key thing in ARA is the access to the rivers and the barge market. So the River Rhine is the biggest river in Europe and gives access to the German market, which consumes a lot of heating oil and diesel, for example. So the cargoes of diesel or the end user products will come to the ARA ports and they are moved so they can access the rivers and then they'll follow the river down to supply the more inland markets. So as you can see, it's very crucial for the European and Northwest Europe market in particular and therefore similar to Singapore in this respect. And so it's used as a pricing hub and again benchmarking for European oil pricing. Another one of note is the Gulf of Mexico. So this is moving to the US now. The crew terminal just offshore, it's known as the Louisiana Operating Platform or Loop. So in this picture here, you'll see that the loop is offshore, so cargoes will load in that area either to export or to import, and then they'll have the oil coming from inland to supply there, or they'll be taking oil from there back inland. So the imports will then gain access to inland US refiners on the Gulf Coast, but also throughout the Midland through the Houston shipping channel, and they can also gain access inland via pipelines, and there's also a lot of storage terminals both on the uh, Gulf Coast itself, and then in the Midland area, particularly Oklahoma, where Cushing is. And in Cushing, there's a huge stockpiling area of US crude, of which the content can vary widely, but typically it will hold 20 to 30 million barrels at least at any point. So the key things to note about the Gulf Coast is that it's the main area whereby crudes are both exported and imported from the US. Also very important is the effect of seasonality because of the hurricanes in the area. So the hurricanes, if they're going to hit inland or the operating platform or the refineries actually on the Gulf Coast, it can have huge ramifications for the benchmark contracts that are used to uh, reflect US oil prices, but also globally it can have big ramifications owing to the uh, closing of exports or need to import oil, given the uh, US is such a crucial importer of certain oil products, and all this can be affected if the uh, Gulf Coast was to be closed. So there are plenty of other ports of note. Uh, this slide gives an indication of the typical sizes and therefore the importance of these ports. A lot of them are actually Chinese. The Chinese are huge consumers of oil, but these ports are everywhere, ranging from Europe, Japan, and Malaysia. The ones that aren't on this picture are because they're outside of the top 20 busiest ports. Some examples include Genoa, which is the med port in North Italy, and that will give access, of course, to Italy, but also the pipeline infrastructure throughout Europe, so will give access to greater Europe. There's Primorsk and ust Luga, which are on the Baltic Sea, this connects Russia and supplies the Eastern European market. Then there's Novorossiysk on the Black Sea. So Russia is an enormous country, so they supply oil from here, the Black Sea, in the Baltic, and also all the way on the other side, you've got the Eastern Siberian Pacific Ocean Pipeline, or ESPO as it's known, which exports to China and other Southeast Asian markets. And the big one you should know in China is Ningbo. So moving on to the cargoes themselves, here is a summary of the vessels. So the names are semi-representative of what the volume is. So there's the ultra-large crew carrier, of which there are very few in the world, and they can hold 3 million barrels plus of crude at any one time. But more commonly for the larger ships, there's the very large crew carriers, or VLCCs, and these can hold up to around 2 million barrels of oil. So then you've got Long Range 2, and as the name suggests, these vessels are used for long voyages, usually oil product voyages, and they can hold up to eight to 950,000 barrels of oil. So then you've got AFRAMAXs, and AFRA, AFRA, stands for Average Freight Rate Assessment. So I guess it's called that because they're the most common oil tanker used, and they can hold 600,000 barrels, and then you've got the smaller vessels, which are typically used for refined products. So they are classified by their size and then what they carry as well. So crude oil and shipping fuel oil, they can be used by the same cargoes simply because the oil itself is quite fresh from the ground and is highly sulfurous in some cases. But ultimately they can't contaminate each other because they are both feedstock for refiners. So refiners have to process crude either way and therefore typically these cargoes transport crude oil and fuel oil in the same vessel without any problems. That said, other refined products, especially when you're talking about diesel and gasoline, 
They have been blended and brought to specification in normal circumstances. So to blend it with any other oil would ruin that blending and it would start to pick up the residual products left in the cargo. And then it's not ultimately the product that the end user has bought, it doesn't meet the specifications. So it's very important that it's a clearly defined cargo ship that carries quite clearly defined specification of oil. So usually they'll be categorized into groups. So they'll be the same kind of cargoes for gasoline, the same for diesel, same for crude, and same for fuel oil typically. But there's no hard and fast rule. Ultimately, the oil traders who move physical around the world, they will just fill the cargoes with what they can and they'll make the calculation of whether to be stringent with what they're putting in with different types of specification or not. And ultimately, they're still going to have to pass specification quality control the other side. So that's a brief summary of what we expect from cargoes in the physical oil market. Another thing to add is that I've talked about the volume in terms of barrels, but the actual capacity in the shipping market is discussed in dead weight metric tons or DWT. And there's a calculation to link that back to barrels. But as oil traders, we know and reference these terms in barrels, as that's ultimately what's traded in the oil market. So moving on to barges. Barges are designed to fit through canals and rivers. Uh, on the previous slides, I was discussing the River Rhine. Uh, the River Rhine can't send cargoes up and down. It's not allowed, it's too narrow, and the water's too shallow to contain or manage cargo ships. So the transport up and down the river is done by barges. And as you can see from this graphic, which gives a general overview, a typical barge will be 1.5 thousand tons or 1.5 kt, it's typically known as. And the bigger one would be 22.5 kt, 22,500 tons. And you'll see these going up and down rivers throughout the key areas in the world. So rail is not as common as the cargo ships and the barges, but it's still used quite a bit to move oil around and particularly important in the US. The US has a huge amount of land to cover and demand for oil comes from many different areas throughout the country. So predominantly it is through pipelines, but rail is still an option, especially for bespoke niche routes. Because the pipeline infrastructure in the US, even though it's highly abundant and continually growing, it's still not enough to satisfy the demand at all times. So the demand is actually more from traders wanting to export US oil at the moment out to the rest of the world. The majority of this oil could be sourced from the Midland or even Canada, and there's huge price dislocations between the region because of the pipeline capacity being maximised almost all of the time. And so rail does become very useful for physical traders looking to explore the arbitrage of the differentials between the two resulting from this dislocation in the two regions. And so we do see quite a bit of rail being used. The only other country of note that really uses it is Russia, given the vast country it is. They use rail alongside pipelines similar to the US, typically to supply their own refiners. But outside of that, cargo ships are a lot more common, especially in Europe given the number of ports and the UK being its own island. So moving on to pipelines, again the US is the most notable due to there being so many different markets within and around the US. These include areas such as the Gulf Coast, New York Harbour, New York Harbour is a key export terminal and import terminal, then we have the Midland where a lot of the production occurs and oil is then sent down there or sent across to Cushing and you still have the western market, in particular the Los Angeles area. Then there's Canada, there's a lot of importing and exporting through pipelines. The Canadians send down heavy crude oil that needs to be highly processed. And then they import that higher specification of oil or light sweet oil because their refiners aren't as complex as the refiners in the US. You can take the Canadian heavy and so you see a lot of flow back and forth because US prefer the heavy, it's cheaper. Canadian prefer the light sweet because they don't have as good refiners. So the key pipelines here are the US Colonial Pipeline and this goes from the Gulf Coast to New York Harbour. You then have the Enbridge pipeline system and the Keystone pipeline system that operates within the inlands of the US. Outside of the US, again, the main ones to note are the Baltic pipeline, which links Russia and the Eastern European markets all the way to the Baltic, as well as supplying the region's inland. So now we have storage. Storage is very important for the oil market because ultimately it could be strategic or can be a consequence of end users wishing to bulk up the inventories to mitigate exposure to supply disruptions, etc. Or probably more importantly, and which has caught a lot of people off guard in the past, is that there's excess oil in the world and particularly oil traders who can't find buyers. They might use storage to strategically move their oil away from the market until they perceive that there to be enough demand or a demand spike to let them then sell that back out. And this can sometimes be the case that actually there's just so much oil that storing it is really the only option because you've just bought it and ultimately no one's going to take it. So what are you going to do? You're not going to offload it into the sea, so you're going to have to store it. Again, this is why 
the derivative market is so important because price differentials from the prompt market and the deferred market will be really critical to determine storage economics. For instance, if the market is heavily oversupplied, but the prices for the forward market or future prices in a year or two is a lot higher, then this will create an opportunity for traders who own storage to fill up their own storage in the prompt right now and then hedge by selling the forward price of oil. If the cost of storing oil month on month is offset by this amount that they're making from the forward demand or the dislocation between buying it in the prompt and selling in the forward, then they can lock it in using derivatives and they can just continue to fill the tanks because they're actually making money from storage as long as they do hedge it out. This was in particular the case in 2014 where oil started to be heavily oversupplied and storage around the world filled up and it got to the stage where those with storage made a lot of money because they were storing this oil and locking in the derivative curve, huge differentials and there was a lot of money to be made doing this. Typically what we call is cash and carry, you may have heard of it, and there needs to be what's known as a contango market. So again, a contango market is when the prices in the prompt are weaker than the prices in the future. And you'll see this reflected as a negative time spread in the futures market. Or if you were to look at it as a curve, the prompt would be lower and the deferred would be higher. So the key storage areas of note, well, firstly, refiners have a lot of inventory which they use because they want to ensure that they can run for at least 30 plus days without any disruptions. And if there is a supply disruption, they will be able to continue for at least for a certain period of time. Depending on the size of the refiner, this can be as much as months at a time even, without needing to source any more crude because they have enough storage in place. But after that, there's a lot of importance on analysis to understand the supply and demand situation when you're looking at storage. So outside of refineries themselves, we've got Saldana Bay. This is in the Western Cape down in South Africa. This area is just purely storage. It's available to be leased by physical oil traders. And this is a key area which will fill up when this type of cash and carry or contango trade comes to fruition. So Sardana Bay will be one of the first areas that will be leased and used up by physical traders in this situation. So you've then got the ARA or Amsterdam, Rotterdam and Antwerp area. There's plenty of storage there of which the information is published on a week on week basis, particularly for refined products, less so crude oil, but you can see how the market is treating the oil available in the market. So whether or not they need to wind down their inventories because there's so much demand they can't meet the production or because there's excess and it starts to build storage information, if you marry it with the rest of the market, it gives you a good indication of the health of the supply and demand situation. So we have Cushing in Oklahoma, as we talked about before in the US, and this is incredibly important. It's the pricing area for WTI futures. So a hell of a lot of oil can be stored at any one point in Cushing, depending on the supply and demand. You've then got the Louisiana offshore oil port and Houston, Texas. There's Fajira in the Middle East and then Singapore around the bunkering hub. So all of these areas are incredibly important to understand what is being stored and the volume of what's being stored. And so it's indicative of the underlying health, as I say. So to conclude, there are many ways to transport oil. Primarily, this is done by transporting cargoes around the world. But in the case of the US market, it still relies heavily on pipeline infrastructure and ultimately railroads, given there's just so much demand in so many places to supply oil and to export from so many different areas. So European and Asian markets, however, are more reliant on the seaborne transportation. And finally, speculators trade the outright storage figures themselves or what the storage numbers are, given that storage is very important to understand the supply and demand situation and therefore impacts the oil derivative market. So that concludes the lecture on transportation of oil. And thank you for listening.